Lord, we give you thanks that you continue to love us and take care of us, that you've sustained us through this day with so many blessings. We thank you especially for our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for his love for us. We thank you that we are here only because he has taken away our rebellion. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who has given us relief. We thank you for the new life that we enjoy in him. We do pray that you would be honored, that you'd be magnified, that your word would be faithfully proclaimed as we study this evening. We ask that you would make us more effective in presenting the claims of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in his blessed name. Amen. I think there are some people who would think that what we're doing this evening, having a presuppositionalist speak about evidences, is like having Ronald Reagan write a campaign speech for Gaddafi. Or they might look at this as something like a um, freak of nature in a circus sideshow. You know, somebody says, come look at the bearded lady. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a presuppositionalist who's going to talk about evidences. Can you imagine that? I think some very misleading implications are sometimes taken from the labeling of two rival theories of evangelical apologetics as evidentialism on the one hand and presuppositionalism on the other. That kind of labeling leads people to think, perhaps leads the unwary to believe, that evidentialists don't have presuppositions and presuppositionalists don't have evidence. I think both of those notions are notoriously erroneous, and I hope to uh, dissuade those who hold those kind of views tonight. Regarding the presuppositionalist attitude toward evidences, we really must see how far off the mark Van Til's critics had been. John Warwick Montgomery misrepresents Van Til as presenting the unbeliever, and I quote him, with an a priori dogmatic instead of the factually compelling evidence for the Christian truth claim. And Clark Pinnock in the same volume, alleges that Van Til, and I, I'm again quoting him, refuses to have anything to do with rational arguments and empirical demonstrations. And so to hear men like this, one is led to believe that Van Til would indeed recoil from presenting verifying evidence for the faith and dismiss the unbelievers' questions without even hearing. The actual truth is that Van Til does not in the slightest reject the proper use of inductive reasoning and empirical evidences and apologetics. I want you to listen to what Van Til himself says about the phenomena of Scripture. And I quote, The point is, we are told that in an infallible Bible there should not be any discrepancies. There should be no statement of historical fact in Scripture that is contradictory to a statement of historical fact given elsewhere. Yet higher criticism has in modern times found what it thinks are facts that cannot possibly be harmonized with the idea of an infallible Bible. What should be the attitude of the orthodox believer with respect to this? Shall he be an obscurantist and hold to the doctrine of the authority of the scripture, though he knows that it can empirically be shown to be contrary to the facts of scripture themselves? It goes without saying that such should not be his attitude. That's what Bantil says in the Christian Theory of Knowledge on page 35. The presuppositionalist is not at all allergic to employing empirical active study according to the scientific method. Indeed, just the opposite. And I'll give you three quotes from Mantel again on that point. He says that it's quite commonly held that we cannot accept anything that is not the result of a sound scientific methodology. With this, we can heartily agree. The Christian position is certainly not opposed to experimentation and observation. And then elsewhere, Mantel says, depreciation of the sense world inevitably leads to a depreciation of many of the important facts of historic Christianity which took place in the sense world. The Bible does not rule out every form of empiricism any more than it rules out every form of a priori reasoning. And one more, the greater amount of detailed study and the more carefully such study is undertaken, the more truly Christian will the method be. It is important to bring out this point in order to help remove the common misunderstanding that Christianity is opposed to factual investigation. The difference between the prevalent method of science and the method of Christianity is not that the former is interested in finding the facts and is ready to follow the facts wherever they may lead, while the latter is not ready to follow the facts. And such affirmations by Van Til, I think, fully comport with presuppositional thinking and method. It's not as though Van Til, on a bad day, forgot what he had said elsewhere and all of a sudden got congenial to empiricism. Uh, these statements are not out of character. They're not inconsistent with the system as a whole. 
Now, evidentialist critics of Van Til, I think, tend to jump back and say, I mean, this is what they've done in my presence anyway, and say things like, well, why doesn't Van Til then use the historical argument for the resurrection? I've actually had people say that to me. I mean, people who are supposed to be professionals at this sort of thing. And I think such a question displays really the blinding effect of preconceptions. Because I want you to listen to Van Til's own words here again. He says, historical apologetics is absolutely necessary and indispensable to point out that Christ rose from the grave. In fact, not only is historical apologetics in general indispensable, Van Til says about himself in particular, and I quote, I would therefore engage in historical apologetics. So the plain and I think rather simple fact is that from the very start, Van Til's presuppositionalism has not been antagonistic to, nor has it been met as a substitute for, evidences and empirical reasoning in support of the historic Christian faith. Indeed, Van Til has always had a tremendous confidence in that. If I might quote him one more time here, he says, Every bit of historical investigation, whether it be in the directly biblical field, archaeology, or in general history, is bound to confirm the truth of the claims of the Christian position. A really fruitful historical apologetic argues that every fact is and must be such as proves the truth of the Christian theistic position. And I would just add to this before I go on to the next point that I want to make this evening. You really must not forget that Van Til lays strong emphasis upon natural revelation in his apologetic. Since he takes natural revelation to be a clear communication from God through the facts of nature and history, a revelation that leaves men guilty for rebelling against God, it is really altogether consistent that Van Til endorses the work of scientists and historians in offering verification for the claims of the Christian faith. So my opening point this evening is very simply that presuppositionalists are not allergic to empirical evidences. In fact, secondly, I'd like to offer for you, just in case you fall asleep later, from the very outset, four, I think, very positive uses for empirical evidences. We might ask, well, then, in what ways will an empirical study of the facts of nature and history benefit the Christian apologist? Now, I think you could put it any number of ways. I've chosen to mention four for you this evening. First of all, I want to suggest that the study of the empirical situation in history and in nature will be of particular value in strengthening the confidence of believers. Evidences, I'm suggesting, offer God's children the answers that they need so as not to be intellectually troubled when they hear the learned objections of non Christian scholars. And I agree with J. Gresham Machen. If nothing else were accomplished by evidences but that, that would be, that would make it worthwhile. That when a young person who goes off to college and hears attacks upon the faith knows of a Christian scholar who approaches evidences correctly, who has answers, and therefore that person's faith is strengthened, he isn't troubled by these antagonistic voices round about, that makes it very important. That is one of the tasks of apologetics. So first and foremost, I mention it. But secondly, empirical evidences can also be used, I think, to embarrass unbelievers in their sarcasm and their criticisms against the Bible's scientific and historic claims. What I'm suggesting here is that evidences can be used to silence the futile empirical objections of unbelievers to the claims of Christianity. And um, it's a threadbare illustration at this point in the 20th century, but, you know, there was a time that Christianity was ridiculed, the Bible was ridiculed, because it mentioned uh, the Hittites, for instance. I mean, it wasn't that a holler. Ha, ha, ha. Look at that. These people believe in this group of people we've never heard of before. And that now we know almost more about the Hittites than any other Near Eastern power because of the work of archaeologists in the 20th century. Evidences can then be used, you see, to silence the sarcasm of unbelievers. Thirdly, uh, beyond that, I think an effective use of empirical evidences might also be helpful in clearing away the mental debris of intellectual prejudice that is held by so many unbelievers. I'm sure you encountered this. I have many times myself. The attitude that is portrayed by the unbeliever is that only anti-scientific people only emotional superstition could lead someone to believe biblical claims. And I think the use of empirical evidences can be very helpful when you're witnessing to someone and defending the faith at the very outset to be used to clear away that mental debris, to open up a way, if you will, so they might hear and consider the message that we have. 
You see, since they begin with this idea that we have nothing to do with science, nothing to do with history, we're to some kind of uh, cultural yahoos and intellectual ignoramuses, the use of those evidences might open them up a bit to say, well, maybe I want to hear more of what this person has to say. And then fourthly, finally, when used in the proper way, evidences can display to the willing unbeliever. Now I've got to stop. What? Has Dr. Bronson forgotten his Calvinistic mores? What do you mean, the willing unbeliever? Well, I mean... But there are sometimes people who are not yet believers in whom the Holy Spirit is working in such a way that their natural resistance has been curbed, perhaps in the process of being taken away, if not actually taken away, and yet they have not heard enough as yet to have affirmed the faith to become believers. There is a curbing effect of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is working in a person's life, Maybe the Holy Spirit works through sickness. I'm not feeling very well tonight, so if you don't like what I'm saying, you probably won't get a real good argument back from me. I just don't feel very ferocious tonight. Sometimes unbelievers may not feel like arguing a great deal, may not um, want to oppose as much as they might ordinarily. On the other hand, there might be times when unbelievers are, as I'm saying by the Holy Spirit, are being changed internally, and part of that change is uh, correlated with our witness to them. In such situations, I'm saying, I think the proper use of evidences can display to the willing unbeliever the wonder of God as the original creator and the providential sustainer and the miraculous redeemer. The wonder of God can be displayed through these evidences. And if people don't have eyes to see, the wonder is still there. And we might pray that God would open their eyes to see it, but the presentation, the proper presentation of evidences allows us to do that. For example, the Bible might just take each one of those categories. The biological fact that life does not spring from non-life, that is, the fact that spontaneous generation is a discredited biological thesis, and the fact that life cannot be produced artificially, at least as yet, even under the most advanced and controlled technological conditions, these facts help us to see God's work in creation. Where does life come from? It comes from God. When I say it helps us to see, I am purposely playing on the etymology of the English word evidence. Something is evidence when it makes something else apparent, when it helps us to see it. And so if someone says, now, I don't see that God is the creator, and I offer him evidence to help him see that. And one of the ways he can see that is by just considering the fact in biology that life doesn't spring from non-life, and nor does it come from even the most advanced, sophisticated, and controlled technological conditions. Life comes from God. Or another example, the chemical fact of molecular bonding in the case of H2O allows for water to form as a liquid. It would not do so otherwise. It would constantly escape as a gas. And yet, the bonding breaks down upon evaporation so that water can spread over other areas and does not lie in its gaseous state heavy upon the surface of the ocean itself. You say, well, so what? Well, you see, if water didn't have those two characteristics, in the first place, the dry areas of the earth would never be watered. And if water didn't, engage, if there wasn't molecular bonding that took place, we wouldn't be able to drink the water. Moreover, it's a fact that water, unlike most every other liquid, expands upon freezing rather than contracting. Indeed, it expands in such a way that at uh, 4 degrees centigrade, it's at its maximum density. And even at that, it floats in water rather than sinking to the bottom. That's a remarkable and very helpful thing for our lives because if it weren't the case, the lakes would freeze from the bottom up because ice would go to the bottom and, and form, and what would happen is those who live in areas like that would not have water when it froze. As it is, however, water freezes on the surface, and underneath you still can get to the liquid form of water. See, this remarkable thing helps us to see the work of God in providence. I can't help but think here of Proverbs, the third chapter, where we read that Jehovah by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths were broken up and the skies dropped down the dew. You see, God displays his wisdom in the water cycle. And it's something we ought to be able to take to the unbeliever and say, see how good God is, see how smart God is? We wouldn't have thought of this. People would be, you know, dying if we had to work out the system of the water cycle. 
Another example, the historical fact that the closest followers of Jesus did not understand and did not expect his resurrection, but were in fact shattered and depressed by his death. That coupled with another fact that the Jewish leaders and Roman guards should have been able to easily produce his body helps us to see the wonder of our Savior's miraculous resurrection as the explanation for the early church's confidence in its preaching. After all, as Paul could say to Festus in Acts 26, this thing has not been done in a corner. It's open to investigation. You see, when we look at the evidences, we do see the wonder of God as our original creator and our providential sustainer and our miraculous savior. Evidences should powerfully impress us with the reality and the truth about God, and they should aid us in pressing those claims upon the unbeliever. And so you understand, first of all, that presuppositionalists are not allergic to evidences. And I've just given you four very briefly, four reasons why evidences can very properly be used in the defense of the Christian faith. And now thirdly, to move on and maybe to add something a little more interesting to you, I would have to add that according to Scripture, evidences cannot stand alone. As indispensable and as valuable as evidences are, it would be a misleading conception to think that evidences can stand on their own in Christian apologetics. And I hope that will be obvious to you from what God's Word teaches. I'm going to give you seven points about what God's Word teaches, and the reason I tell you that in advance is not just to help you take notes if that's what you're doing this evening, but later I'm going to correlate these very same seven points to seven philosophical observations that need to be made in apologetics. But first of all, seven things that we should be able to learn from the Bible relevant to the use of evidences. Number one, what people will think about the observed evidence is affected by their non-observational beliefs. It's kind of a strange way of putting a truth that should be right there in the Bible, isn't it? But think about it. What people think about the observed evidence is affected by their non-observational beliefs. We have some illustrations here. Turn to Matthew, the 28th chapter. I'd like to read just verses 12, 13, and 17, Matthew 28. At verse 12, we read, And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave much money unto the soldiers, saying, Save me, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. What's important about that? What's important about it is that the people who are saying this knew the tomb was empty. And they had interviewed the soldiers, and the soldiers knew the right story. And so what people say about the evidence is, in a very crass sense now, affected by some non-observational beliefs, isn't it? But isn't just with the hostile unbelievers that that's true. If you go down in the chapter and look at um, verse 17, you'll see it's true of believers, too. We read, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. And then three words that a lot of people wish weren't in the Bible because they're so, they just don't fit. It doesn't seem to us. But some doubt it. Wait a minute. There are people who are now bowing down and worshiping the resurrected Savior. And they're doubting. They're doubting their senses. They wonder, how can this be? I mean, even if we try to put a, a nicer complexion on this by saying, well, this is the doubt that comes from a joy that says, this is just incredible, it's unbelievable, it's too good to be true. The fact is they were doubting. Doubting what they could see with their own eyes. And other illustrations could be given. Luke 24, verses 16 and 31 indicates that when the resurrected Christ appeared to some people, they didn't even recognize him. I suppose you can interpret that as some kind of miraculous disguising that Jesus engaged in. It's also possible to say that since their expectations were so unbelieving, they couldn't see him. And John 21, verse 12 would be another illustration of that. All right, a second point to be made about the biblical understanding of evidences is that in dealing with the claims of Christ, the Bible tells us no one is truly detached, no one is truly uncommitted one way or another. Jesus put it this way in Matthew's Gospel, no one can serve two masters, and elsewhere, he who is not with me is against me. Matthew 6.24 and Matthew 12, verse 30. Indeed, if you want to look at almost the whole of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you will see that what one presupposition sees as foolish Another presupposition interprets as wisdom. 
And so in dealing with the claims of Christ, no one is really uncommitted one way or another. Thirdly, the Bible says, it teaches us that the non-observational commitments of the unbeliever are objectively foolish and lead to the destruction of knowledge because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And I have so many passages here, I couldn't read them all for you in this one lecture. But let's just take one example. I say the non-observational commitments of the unbeliever. Psalm 10.4 tells us that the unbeliever, the fool, says in his heart there is no God. Now these commitments are objectively foolish. They aren't just a matter of one team calling another team foolish, just a matter of party loyalty. See, the Bible says that's foolish. It's objectively foolish because it leads to the destruction of knowledge. And you can uh, pursue that, for instance, in Proverbs 1, verses 22 and 29. Fools hate knowledge. Romans 1, 21 and 22. And 1 Timothy 6, 20, which calls the oppositions of the faith only the pseudonym of knowledge, falsely called knowledge. Fourthly, the Bible tells us that all men inescapably have an inner knowledge of God, the one whose sovereign power and plan hold the universe with regularity. He works all things after the counsel of his own will. But all men inescapably have this inner knowledge of God, of course, as seen in Romans 1, verses 20 and 21, Romans 2.15, Genesis 1.27, speaking of man is made in the image of God, and you recognize already the allusion to Ephesians 1.11 as working all things after the counsel of his own will. So 17 and 18. It's an amazing thing. Even when the unbeliever knows how bad things are going for him intellectually, he prefers that to humbling himself to God before God. Sixthly, this explains why it is that regarding such empirical evidence as the resurrection, if I can quote Luke 16:31, we read, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, no one rise from the dead. It's interesting, isn't it? On the road to Emmaus, when Jesus encounters his two followers who are down in the mouth about what has happened, the death of their master, you would think if Jesus took the approach contemporary American empiricism, he'd just say, here I am. And what's the problem? Why are you unbelieving? I'm standing right before you. Seeing to believing. Remember, here I am. But we don't see Jesus taking that approach. He instead opens the scriptures and expounds to them until their hearts burn within them, you see. Finally, it's come home. If you don't receive the message of the scriptures, you won't believe though somebody rises from the dead. And then seventhly, nevertheless, the objective revelation provided by God and the evidence of history and scripture is such that we can, through the resurrection, know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That's what Peter said in Acts 2, verse 36. You might compare Luke 1, verse 4, where we read that we can know the certainty of the things in which we have been instructed, or consider this interesting expression in 1 John 2, verse 3, that we know that we know about matters pertaining to our salvation. The objective revelation provided by God is such that we can know for certain that God has made Jesus Lord in Christ. And so the Bible shows us that uh, evidences cannot stand alone for these seven reasons. I'd like to move on then to add to that observation some philosophical problems with what might be called autonomous evidentialism. Sadly, the biblical insights that I have been going over this evening are ignored by those who call themselves evidentialists in our day. Their hope and aim is to have the unbeliever approach the uninterpreted facts in a neutral fashion to see how they can demonstrate the probability of Scripture's truth. No presuppositions are supposed to intrude in the reasoning of believer and unbeliever as they open-mindedly, without philosophical prejudice, approach the observational particulars of the world and history. That sounds like a very grand scheme. I, I imagine if it's something that could be successfully done, we'd all be sufficiently impressed. I do want you to know that without my going through and quoting book after book after book, that I'm not at all putting words in anybody's mouths. I and mean, this is exactly what they will say. 
that one cannot have presuppositions, that the only truly scientific method must be objective and neutral. The facts must do the speaking and not our preconceptions, and on and on and on and on. The idea is that uninterpreted facts are particulars that we can observe, and that they will be the test for the various theories we might have about the world and history and human life. In taking such an approach, say, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I'm afraid that apologists have fallen prey to many detailed errors in their outworking of the non-presuppositional argument from the inductive evidence. And I suppose it's incumbent upon me not just to make that accusation, but to illustrate it. And so let me give you four illustrations of this. Um, for those of you who are not read up, at least in great detail on this, the historical argument for the resurrection as it's popularly presented in evidentialist literature in our day when something like this. We can get a fairly reliable understanding of the claims of the early church from what we read in the New Testament because of the early date of the documents of the New Testament that we can verify historically and empirically. When we read these documents, we find evidence that can be used to lead to the conclusion that the only alternative, the only reasonable alternative, is that Jesus must have risen from the dead, because in the first place, if the disciples were lying, why would they have been willing to die for a lie? And Charles Dickens wouldn't die for Tiny Tim, would he? Why would Peter die for a, a, a lie about the resurrected Messiah? Uh, other theories, such as the swoon theory or the mistaken tomb theory, they also can be discredited. And so the idea is, with all these other theories being discredited, the only reasonable hypothesis that can account for the change in the disciples from one of depression and fear to confidence and bold preaching of the resurrection is that it must have happened. We know that Jesus anticipated his resurrection because we find that taught in the pages of the New Testament. And we know that what is reported in the pages of the New Testament is accurately the teaching of Jesus because he promised to give total recall to his followers. And so the argument goes on and on, allegedly inch by inch supporting the hypothesis that Jesus must have risen from the dead. But that is meant as, a, as an impressive argument for the resurrection of Jesus Christ to an unbeliever on neutral ground, miserable failure. I want to tell you, just before I get into the arguments about this, a little autobiographical fact here. The amazing thing is, I once thought those arguments were pretty good. I used to use those arguments when I uh, would witness to people. And so it, it bothered me after I came through an epistemological and philosophical channel to see, to see, to see what we all had in common? Christian presuppositions. Well, starting with the Christian outlook on the world, the evidence was fantastic. And you know what? It was. It is. But if this evidence is presented outside of that framework, if it's being presented as though we don't know anything about God, and we don't know about history, and we don't know about human life, and we have no philosophical preconceptions, you see, on that basis, these are miserably bad arguments. Some illustrations. For example, one, why should the unbeliever accept the basic reliability of the extant New Testament documents simply due to their early date? And that's a step that I always took very readily. Unbeliever wouldn't take that step. He'd be ridiculous to take that step. If a document is full of what is taken as the most obvious absurdities and superstitions, let us look at the large number of purported miracles in this book. Axe heads floating, people walking on water, water turned to wine, people rising from the dead. I mean, this book is full of fairy tales like that. Would he be impressed... Just because we have the autographical copy of the document that made all these preposterous claims, where he say, oh, well, this must be a fairly reliable book, because look how early it is. He doesn't follow in the slightest. He doesn't think the basic reliability of the book has anything to do with its date. Secondly, you must listen closely, because sometimes this misses people. There's a subtlety to this, but it's very important. How can the naturalistic unbeliever be expected to treat these documents simply as reliable reports of what Jesus said about himself. You see, the um, autonomous evidentialist sometimes says, you don't have to believe the claims about Jesus, just believe he made these claims. I don't think we can get that far. Why should I, as an autonomous scholar, believe that there was such a man who made claims like that? Such reports would have me think that a mere man 
according to the naturalistic skeptic, a mere man claiming an incredible divine character and prerogative and predicting his own resurrection. Now, let us see much more probable to me Certainly it seems more probable to the consistent use of common sense that the apostles misconstrued what their teacher was trying to say to them. After all, I can prove that from my teaching experience. Students do that. That's far more common, isn't it, than 30 to 40 years later they had total recall about these claims? Isn't it much easier to believe that they exaggerated in veneration for him later what he earlier had said? Isn't it easier just to believe they didn't get it right, didn't remember it accurately? Thirdly, the defense that's made to this by virtually every non-presuppositional evidentialist, you look at Montgomery, you look at Sproul, and so forth, they all will claim, but you see, Christ promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to his followers to enable them to remember and interpret correctly what he taught. A defense which, I hope you catch, blatantly begs the question, doesn't it? Because it assumes the very deity of Jesus, which the argument for the resurrection is supposed to be proving. And so there goes that argument. Another way in which we can see this problem, I think, is by considering the kind of informal logic that is used by autonomous evidentialists. It goes like this. If Jesus rose from the dead, then he is God, and accordingly speaks the truth at every point. But I think we should add that that logic, that inference pattern, is far from reflecting the unbiased and accepted uniform conclusion or thinking of the world of advanced scholarship. After all... um, The logic of such an argument is itself derived from and warranted by the scriptures, isn't it? I mean, if the scriptures teach us that, and that's what we're using now to interpret the evidence, then we are again begging the question, we're arguing in a circle, which would mean that Christ's interpretation of himself is taken on the basis of Christ's interpretation of himself. And that this reason is subject to dispute is perhaps illustrated... Um, by considering just three of the aspects of it. First of all, we have this inference, if resurrected, then divine. I think that's um, hardly acceptable if one applies it in a discriminating and special pleading fashion. And yet, one is going to have to apply that in a discriminating and special pleading fashion, or else you're going to end up concluding that Lazarus is God also. Resurrection does not prove deity. Secondly, the committed secularist would almost certainly look upon this inference pattern as a manifestation of a rather primitive God of the gaps thinking. He would present an alternative inference pattern that is more congenial to naturalism. His would go like this. If Jesus rose from the dead, then very complex and sophisticated biological principles and factors surpassing those presently recognized and utilized by scientists remain to be discovered and rendered in natural formulas. That is, if you convince me historically a cadaver resuscitated, then I'm telling you we've got a lot more work to do as biologists because there must be some principles that account for that. And then thirdly, one clearly is begging all sorts of important questions if he simply reasons that if Jesus was God, he always spoke the truth. Because any uh, philosopher of religion will tell you that uh, there are many competing conceptions of God. And in just one illustration, if you will, the Greek gods were not unfailing truth-tellers by any means. And if Jesus is God in that sense, then we have no reason to believe him any more than you'd believe some kind of jealous husband. And so you see that if you present the empirical evidence for the resurrection, which, as I admit to you, Christian standpoint is very... uh, very strong, very compelling, reassuring, but if you present that outside of the circle of Christian commitment in a kind of neutral fashion, saying we don't need any presuppositions, we can see the evidence will take us to these conclusions, they just don't take us to those conclusions at all. Van Til's presuppositional approach to the evidences takes account of the fundamental philosophical and theological truths that I'm now going to give seven of them, corresponding to the seven biblical insights we saw just a few moments ago. A presuppositional approach to the evidences would be quite different than this autonomous one that I've been talking about. In the first place, we need to recognize that all empirical observation is inescapably theory-laden. That is to say, there are no uninterpreted or brute facts. You say, now what's that guy talking about up there? Very laden, well, on a very simplistic, misleading, although captivating idea of what happens in human knowledge transactions. People think, well, there are two types of things we believe. There are observation beliefs and there are theory-type beliefs. 
The observation beliefs are the ones we can verify directly by opening our eyes or ears or touching or what have you. And then there are things that go beyond observation that count as our theories. And, to add one more step to this simplistic, but I think deceivingly um, simplistic idea, our theories are justified by our observations. We build up our theories, in fact, by observing the world. We hypothesize something, we go out and check it, observation confirms it, now that theory has been supported by our observations. And then on and on we build, and all these knowledge transactions support one another. The difficulty is there are no observations that are free of theories, which is to say, no one observes, interprets, understands anything in his sensible experience, apart from the theory by which the experience is intelligible. There are no facts that are just seen pure and simple. You say, well, I walk outside in the garden, I see the rose bush, I say, there is a rose. Well, what theory does that presuppose? Well, you see, the asking of the question makes us smile, doesn't it? Because it betrays the naivete of the questioner. Well, what, well in the first place, it presupposes something about human language, doesn't it? presupposes that in the English language, what you say is, there is a rose. I don't imagine everybody everywhere would just put it that way, right? Not everyone's an English speaker. But even in the circle of competent English speakers, that presupposes a number of things. About the endurability of physical objects, about the reliability of sensation, any number of things. And so, every time we make an observation and interpret it to ourselves, we're engaged in some kind of theoretical process and not simply observing Secondly, the presuppositionalist notes that the acceptance and interpretation that one takes as factual is not determined by sense perception alone, but in interaction with one's fundamental philosophical convictions. To put it simply, there is no presuppositionalist neutrality. If someone were to come and tell me that last night they had a conversation with my dead great-grandfather, I would not, on the basis of their empirical report, believe it. Now, I suppose you could say, well, that's just how perverse you are. If you were a better scientist, you would. But I think if you would allow me to take you into, you know, either philosophy halls or scientific labs around this country, you'd find out that that is, in fact, what a good scientist would do. He would prefer to conserve his um, theories and say that there are far more likely plausible accounts for why you're saying you saw my great-grandfather, now from the dead, then my thinking that I should just take this for granted and not change everything else that I've believed about uh, the nature of life and death and whatever else I've learned as a biologist. No, as a matter of fact, one alleged disconfirming experience is not usually, hardly ever, I think, taken as decisive for people. In fact, if you want to stop and think about it, you, um, you listen to a Buddhist and a uh, Christian evidentialist talk to one another and we'll see how it ships can pass in the dark. What do you take as real? What do you take as reliable? Depends not on your senses if you're a Buddhist at all. In fact, if you're a Buddhist or even a Hindu, everything is maya. To trust your senses is the height of irreligiosity and absurdity. No one trusts his senses. And so, obviously, the acceptance and interpretation of what is true and factual is not determined by sense perception alone. Thirdly, empirical inductive study in itself has certain preconditions which can be intelligibly accounted for only on the presupposition of Christianity. That is, the very use of the scientific method, the empirical inductive approach to things, already assumes matters, has preconditions which preconditions need some intellectual justification? And I'm suggesting they can only be intellectually accounted for in the presupposition of Christianity. In which case, scientific and historical study, wittingly or unwittingly, assume what believers are defending all along. If you really had an unbeliever that thought things through, he'd say, no, I'm not going to let you take me out there to study things scientifically, because that assumes a causal universe. And I know that a causal universe presupposes a God who created and controls things. I'm not going to get caught in that trap. I'd rather be irrational than to have to go out there and use evidences. Now, because that's an epistemologically self-conscious unbeliever, you see. <laughs> if he wants to go out and study the scientific world, he'll say, that's great. Everything you find out there is going to confirm the Christian claim... But if you don't think so, I'd like to know, why are you studying scientifically at all? Why are you trusting your senses? Why are you expecting the universe to show a kind of uniformity that science presupposes? Questions like that. 
Fourthly, what is assumed by the consistently non-Christian understanding of empiricism and induction contradicts biblical teaching. Okay, we know that. But my point is that it also renders empirical inductive reasoning impossible in philosophical principle. Uh, for instance, if we rigorously reject the intrusion of arbitrary metaphysical prejudices, and man's mind is taken as something like a tabula rasa, a blank tablet, in a completely contingent, random, or chance universe where there are only sensible particulars and not abstract universals. If that's what we think, and that's of course what pure empiricism is supposed to think, there can be no logical or natural laws. There can be no laws in a universe where there's only particulars. There can be no generalization either, in which case there can be no probability. And there can be no intelligible appeal to causality, which is a universal and not a particular, as David Hume pointed out so embarrassingly. Language could not be learned in such a universe. Radical subjectivity and the egocentric predicament could not be avoided. And there could be no justification for maintaining the reliability of sense perception, or even better, the reliability of our memory of sense perceptions. So what I'm saying is that the consistently non-Christian understanding of empiricism contradicts the biblical teaching as well as rendering empirical inductive reasoning impossible in philosophical principle. Fifthly, unbelievers, just like believers, are not at all unbiased or impartial, without motives and goals, are completely open-minded, purely disinterested, and where they will be led by their handling of the empirical evidence. The fact is we are usually being led by an idea, not being pushed by the evidence to that as a conclusion, not in any simple way. Sixthly, if the unbeliever's espoused presuppositions are not challenged, and if he holds tenaciously and consistently to his presuppositions, he can, for very good reason, refuse to be driven from his position by a consideration of empirical evidences alone. If I offer him only empirical evidences, and he is tenacious in holding on to his presuppositions, I will never be able to push him from his position. You see, at the worst, level, the unbeliever would rather say that his senses are deceiving him than capitulate and say, yes, Jesus rose from the dead, and then he is God, and I am guilty, and I'm going to hell. The unbeliever, you see, if he keeps to his presuppositions, cannot be dissuaded by evidences alone. And then seventhly, because the believer's intellectual basis for certainty, now I'm talking about certainty here, not simply emotional confidence or subjective assurance, and not simply volitional commitment to the faith. If our intellectual basis for certainty about the claims of the Christian faith is broader than the limited and fallible reflections that we bring to the incomplete pool of available empirical indicators, if that is the case, as a presuppositionist in the Bible would say, I think, then our claims about history and nature should not merely be considered or presented as probably true. The presuppositional approach to the evidence says, yes, I make mistakes in the consideration and reflection upon evidences. And yes, my experience of the pool of relevant empirical indicators is limited. But nevertheless, because the basis for my certainty is broader than my experience and my trust in my own reasoning, then I need not think that I'm limited to mere probability in my claims. Now, I'm going to just take a second here for an aside. In order to present the claims of Christianity as more than matters of a limited statistical assurance, uh, probability, apologists who are evidentialists in the sense that I don't believe uh, they should be, apologists like Montgomery and Pinnock and Sproul, must resort to one of two, perhaps both, steps that will point out something I think destructive about what they're doing in defending the faith. I'm suggesting that we as Christians, certainly as Calvinists, don't want to lower the claims of Christ to the probability level. Okay, I, I debated with R.C. Spur one evening, and I presented that difficulty to him, to which he said, from an intellectual standpoint, all we have is probability. But we can still preach the claims of Christ with certainty. I said, well, how can you go beyond the level of your intellectual confidence in doing that? And this is what I'm getting at. Two things are done by Montgomery, Pinnock, or Spill. One, they at that point resort to subjective matters like experiential proof, 
or the practical certainty which compels us to take action despite risk, that's what he told me that night, or the inward convicting witness of the Spirit in order to enable them to take the leap of faith up from the level of what intellectual proof honestly warrants, no more than probability, to the higher level of full belief and personal confidence. And then secondly, or secondly, press the fallacies of overstatement and hasty generalization into service, so as to maintain a public stance of being committed to full biblical inerrancy exclusively on the platform of evidentialism or natural theology, now, despite they're not examining or proving the scriptures every claim, and despite the admission of unresolved empirical difficulties regarding some of the scriptures' claims, they must do that by saying, since we have proven some, we can be sure of all, which is just a logical fallacy. And from these two observations, I think it becomes ironically evident that those who have criticized Van Til for being a fideist are, in fact, much closer to it in reality than he has ever been. Because what they have is an intellectual level that demands probability and a preaching style that demands inerrancy and full confidence. And you just can't bring that together in all honesty. All right, so let me see if I can retrace my steps for you this evening before I go on to make some further applications. Presuppositionalists are not allergic to evidences. We do believe in the use of them. And four of the uses that evidences can be uh, put to are, first of all, giving assurance and answering troubling questions of God's children. The secondly, embarrassing unbelievers in their sarcasm, silencing them in their criticisms of Scripture. Thirdly, perhaps a debris-clearing technique, opening up their minds to listen a little bit longer to our presentation, since we aren't the buffoons we're made out to be. And fourthly, because the actual wonder of God as creator, sustainer, and redeemer can be seen in the empirical world about us. However, according to the scripture, these evidences cannot stand alone. There are other considerations that must always be brought in to this context. And then we've looked at some philosophical problems with autonomous evidentialism, how the arguments just don't carry weight if they're presented in a neutral setting. And then we've noted seven corresponding philosophical observations to show us why the neutral use of evidences is not going to be satisfactory. This leads me then to a conclusion, something of a sub-conclusion, and that's, I can put it this way, facts and meaning stand together, or I could say facts and values stand together, or I could say observations and presuppositions stand together. What I'm getting at is that our one-on-one -on -one encounter with the world, our senses, goes hand in hand always with our understanding of meaning or of value, our principles and presuppositions. In this sense, we might say that evidence and presuppositions are like distinct but inseparable perspectives on the truth about God. In fact, some presuppositionists have put it that way, and I think it's very helpful. It's a good insight. But I, I do want us to be cautious, nevertheless, if we put it that way, not to, on the one hand, relativize, or on the second hand, obscure the distinction between observations and principles, or between facts and and presuppositions. For instance, um, one perspectival presuppositionalist whom I respect greatly has recently written in the Bulletin of the Evangelical Philosophical Society and has argued in a very neat and tidy fashion that we need both presuppositional and evidential apologetics, also personal or subjective apologetics. But the point is that from a presuppositional and reform standpoint, we are not asking for presuppositions or evidence, we need both approaches. And he's exactly right in that. However, I think it is overstated, perhaps mistaken, for him to say in the process that no one perspective has ultimate priority. In fact, um, perhaps I could read here for you. We read, um, similarly idolatrous in my view is the attempt to give any one perspective a priority over the others. And that is to claim that one perspective, rather than the others, furnishes the ultimate ground for belief in something. Only God's Word furnishes such an ultimate ground, and God's Word is available to us in all three perspectives. These perspectives being, you see, the normative or the a priori perspective that the Word and Law of God provides to us, the situational or empirical, more observational perspective, 
that we get in general revelation, natural revelation around about us, and then thirdly, the more existential or subjective perspective that we get in considering the facts of human personality and our interaction with laws and facts. But none of these perspectives has an ultimate priority, and uh, I'm enamored of that kind of language, but upon analysis, I'm not sure that I agree with that in the end. In fact, I'm not sure that the author agrees with it either. You see, it's just because some of our beliefs do have priority that we call them presuppositions. You see, I have what Willard Van Orman Quine, a secular epistemologist, has called a web of beliefs. See, and they support each other in various ways. And when you break the web at one point, it creates alterations in my belief structure elsewhere. And what I'm usually going to do is try to repair my web in the fastest and most convenient way. I'm going to be the most conservative I can. So that when something contradicts one of my beliefs, I'm going to alter only what I have to in order to save consistency in my web. Now, when you put it that way, you have something of a fleshed-out illustration of ultimacy of beliefs. You see, one's ultimate beliefs are those ones that lie closest to the center of the web, which I will disturb only, only in the most vicious of circumstances. I'm going to hold on to those beliefs no matter what. I mean, it would, I would have to have a whole new web if I gave up those. And of course, I believe that unbelievers have those sorts of central convictions which must be destroyed so that they can have a new web. It's what we call conversion, as a matter of fact. And that's a, not, uh, oh, a new mind, a new way of saying things. Okay, now Christians have those as well. All of us do. We have our basic presuppositions. I'd also say there's no reason why um, one's ultimate presuppositions have to be of this or that sort. I think people can be very arbitrary about that. They can, they can say, you know, the thing that counts the most to me is that the moon is yellow. And anything, anything that contradicts that, I'm going to fight against. I'm going to find any other alternative than to give up my belief in the moon's being yellow. I don't know why anybody would be led to that. I mean, it would be a strange psychological case, I think, but you could make that your ultimate belief. But the point is, it's just the ultimacy of my defense of that that makes it a presupposition for me. And things that are out further from the center are more observational, things I'm more willing to give up without moving into the center of the web. Now, my point is, it's just because some of our beliefs have that kind of priority or centrality to change the image that we call them presuppositions. And so I would tend to think that uh, though there are different perspectives on God's truth, there are also more prior, or more basic, more central approaches to the truth of God in nature, human personality, and scripture than others. I think also that uh, the person that I quoted ends up saying that as well because he ends up saying only God's word furnishes such an ultimate ground. What's of interest, though, is that earlier in the article, the author had said that God's word was the a priori perspective, taking the place of rationalism in terms of epistemological schema in the history of thought. Rationalism kind of corresponds with God's law, God's word. Empiricism kind of corresponds with general revelation, what we see in nature and history. And then uh, subjectivism corresponds to the witness of God internally, as we see in Romans 2. Now, given that general correlation, if God's word is the ultimate ground, then that means the a priori perspective is the one that has been given some kind of ultimacy. Moreover, later in the same article, our presuppositionalist, perspectivalist writes, and I quote, without the Christian God to correlate the law, the a priori perspective, the world, the a posteriori, or the empirical perspective, and the self, the subjective perspective, without the Christian God to correlate the law, the world, and the self, there is little reason to suppose that the three will cohere. But then why do we believe they will cohere? Well, it seems like we're going to have to engage in some kind of meta-perspectival talk then, in order to discuss and to justify that conviction. Later, just a couple of paragraphs down from this, the author says, Indeed, my position would be relativistic if it were not for my presupposition derived from Scripture that each perspective brings us into contact with God's truth. And so here we have a couple of meta-perspectival convictions about all three perspectives cohering and all three perspectives uh, bringing us into contact with God's truth. 
And so when we ask the question, well now, how do we justify that view of the perspectives themselves, the answer is where we get this from Scripture, which is what we call the a priori approach, or what I would call our basic presuppositional approach as Christians. God's revelation is prior to, more ultimate than, the facts of experience. Now, I also said it's inseparable from the facts of experience. I wouldn't want to pretend that I knew it was in God's Word without opening my eyes or ears and reading it or seeing it in nature or what have you. I certainly agree all three perspectives are working simultaneously, but I do think we do afford a priority or ultimacy to our presupposition taken from God's Word. Facts and meaning stand together. However, that doesn't mean facts and meaning are the same. Uh, sometimes we hear a slogan like, presuppositions and evidences are one. Well, that can be taken in two ways. If you mean they are one package, I agree. And that's, in fact, kind of the point of tonight's lecture. They are parts of one package. They're inseparable. The evidences that go with the presuppositions and the presuppositions that make the evidences intelligible are one. But to say that they're identical, on the other hand, I think would be mistaken. Well, I don't think that is what is meant. I say there's no difference between a presupposition and an observation that is warranted in light of or in the context of the presupposition, I don't think would be what we'd want to claim here. Facts and meaning stand together. Van Til puts it this way, I quote him, For any fact to be a fact at all, it must be a revelational fact. By thus repudiating the idea of an uninterpreted, brute, or random fact, Van Til precludes an essential element of a traditional, non-presuppositional approach to evidentialist apologetics, which holds that the objects of perception carry no inherent meaning or interpretation and can be approached in a neutral fashion without man's mind assuming any meaning or interpretation for them. And in that case, the facts could disclose nothing whatsoever, Van Til says. But there would be nothing within the facts or within the mind of the investigator to objectively determine an order or relationship or specific quality or modality for these random sensations. If facts signify nothing in themselves, then they, whatever the they could possibly amount to there, if it's a brute fact, what is the they in the case of a brute fact? I mean, just the, the indeterminacy of that uh, uh, way of putting it is appropriate. Whatever they are cannot be used to test worldviews because they would be compatible with any number of conflicting systems, since systems of interpretation are imposed on the facts. Since they're imposed on the facts, the facts can't possibly test them. So Van Til's denial of brute facts and purely observational knowledge, that is, observations free of all theory, is in line with, I think, the most recent philosophical criticism of the epistemological theory of empiricism as it's been traditionally understood, and eventuating in the distinctive tenets eventually of positivism. What complicates the apologetical situation, though, is that the non-Christian tries, unsuccessfully, but tries to suppress completely the evidential force of the facts by choosing and thoroughly applying presuppositions which run counter to what those facts inherently indicate, the truth of Christianity. Apologetics is thus required to argue in such a way as to strip away the autonomous and rebellious glasses through which the unbeliever looks at the revelational facts. Accordingly, Van Til's defense of the faith, and I quote him here, argues that every fact must be such as proves the truth of the Christian theistic position. The evidences, which are innumerable, must be presented in a manner which compels a return to their true nature as confirmatory of Christianity. So how does one do that? Van Til says it is indispensable to present empirical evidences to unbelievers, and then he immediately adds, I quote, I would not talk endlessly about facts and more facts without ever challenging the unbeliever's philosophy of fact. End of quote. Put it very simply, philosophical or presuppositional apologetics forms the context within which the use of evidences is intelligible and forceful. Without recognizing his biblical presuppositions and their epistemological necessity, the Christian cannot make sense out of his own apologetical argument with unbelievers based upon the empirical evidence. For instance, if he agrees to base his reasoning upon the assumption of complete contingency in history, I approach the unbeliever and say, look, I don't want you to take anything for granted. Anything can happen. 
It's an open universe. If it's an open universe, it's not really a universe, but that's for another lecture. He says, look, anything can happen. Chance governs history here, random factuality. If the unbeliever buys into that to open the door to present his evidences, then he cannot justify inductive empirical thinking any more than his opponent can. But you see, if that's his view of history, then there's no reason to use the scientific method, because then the universe is not regular. Moreover, his appeal to miracles becomes completely unintelligible, since there's no objective background of uniformity in terms of which an event is miraculous. And once I go to the unbeliever and say, you must believe resurrections are possible, anything can happen, right? The unbeliever says, yeah, I think anything can happen. I say, okay, Jesus rose from the dead, anything can happen. <laughs> he hadn't gotten anywhere. He was in a woman, this is very special, anything. Oh no, in a chance universe, nothing special, anything can happen. Don't you get it? We aren't talking seriously to one another if we don't say anything can happen. Furthermore, if the apologist does not challenge the unbeliever's underlying philosophy, the appeal to empirical evidences need not lead to excessive at all. In fact, he may say, yeah, well, I agree with you. We're going to have to do a lot more study to account for that. Our work's not done as scientists. I don't want him to get to that kind of conclusion. That just entrenches him in his naturalism. So with his presuppositions, he, not, he need not at all infer that a miracle occurred. In fact, if you think about it, he need not infer that Jesus was raised from the dead. He need not infer that Jesus must be the divine Son of God, much less that he rose for our justification, or that he is to be the judge of the world, all of which are biblical inferences. None of these judgments are purely empirical in nature, and none of them follows logically within the worldview or basic system of thought of the naturalist. After all, all he knows is that a dead body is now breathing, or was once breathing. And until, puts it this way, People will say, no, wait a minute, that's not good enough, because surely the resurrection of Jesus is unusual. It's nearly unique, isn't it? An occurrence that's that unique has to be appreciated as something special. Uh, and I think Van Til would say to that, yes, it is something special, but exactly how one philosophically treats the realm of the unusual is open to a much wider variety of intellectual options than most evidentialists realize. After all, these very special things called resurrections are happening every Friday night at the movie theater, too. Did you know that? There's all sorts of spooky things happening, people coming back from the dead. And so that's one way we handle the unusual. Mantell cryptically observed this in the defense of the faith. He said that on non-Christian assumptions, far from um, needing to be a matter of religious solemnity or even religious significance, he said the resurrection of Jesus would be a fine item for Ripley's Believe It or Not. Don't you see, we are not presenting the evidence for Christianity when it's presented in a vacuum or when it's presented in an alleged neutral context where the presuppositions of the unbeliever are not simultaneously being attacked. Consequently, Van Til has taught that it is impossible and it's useless to seek to defend Christianity as a historical religion by a discussion of the facts only. If we would really defend Christianity as a historical religion, we must, he says, at the same time defend the theism upon which Christianity is based, and this involves us in philosophical discussion. A philosophical discussion where the fact of the resurrection is not artificially and sharply separated from the system of meaning in terms of which it is inevitably understood. Therefore, Van Til would not in the least, as he says, disparage the usefulness of arguments for the corroboration of the scripture that came from archaeology. He would simply want to insist that, and I'm quoting him, such corroboration is not of independent power. Because unbelievers self-deceptively espouse presuppositions contrary to those of the Christian, while nevertheless in actuality knowing God and inconsistently living in terms of that suppressed truth, truth which constitutes the Christian's acknowledged presuppositions, unbelievers can understand the evidences presented by the believer and do, if the Holy Spirit graciously removes their resistance to the truth, they do in some cases on that basis alone draw the correct conclusion from the evidences. The reason I say that is I'm not trying to tell you that when you present your defense of the faith, you're witnessing to somebody, a challenge comes back and you say, you begin with, say, the resurrection argument understood in terms of the Christian worldview of creation and providence. And the person says, oh, well, then I want to become a Christian. Obviously, they say, no, wait a minute, you haven't heard the whole story yet. 
we got a philosophical defense, too, and I want you to hear that, too. Now, obviously, at some, some point, the evidence can, by God's grace, be sufficient in some cases. But you see, when resistance is there, the evidence cannot not be explicated further so that the presuppositions by which it is intelligible are made clear. Bantha says, we should present the message and evidence for the Christian position as clearly as possible, knowing that because man is what the Christian says he is, the non-Christian will be able to understand in an intellectual sense the issues involved. In so doing, we shall to a large extent be telling him what he already knows but seeks to suppress. This reminding process provides a fertile ground for the Holy Spirit, who in sovereign grace may grant the non-Christian repentance so that he may know him who is life eternal. Well, that's not a good place to stop, though, Dr. Bronson, because what if it doesn't turn out so nicely? What if the Holy Spirit's not changing the person at that point, and the evidences aren't carrying through to that kind of conclusion? But then my final point is we need to understand that part of our presentation of evidences is that only Christianity saves the scientific method. If the unbeliever stubbornly and consistently clings to his espoused presupposition, and by means of them resists the force of the evidence as confirming Christian claims, then we must, of necessity, and I think is usually the case, make explicit use of presuppositional argumentation. We must discuss the foundations of empirical study and inductive method in order to show that Christianity alone saves any scientific and historical knowledge that we wish to have. I can quote Van Til again, Christianity does not thus need to take shelter under the roof of a scientific method independent of itself. It rather offers itself as a roof to methods that would be scientific. We must aim to show the unbeliever that by striving to move away from the revealed meaning that is indicated in the facts, he simultaneously moves away from the possibility of giving any account of the intelligibility and possibility of scientific knowledge about nature and history. Manta says, what we will have to do then is to try to reduce our opponent's position to absurdity. Nothing less will do. For instance, the apologist must challenge the legitimacy of the scientific method as based upon an assumed metaphysic of chance. At the heart of it all, the point is that the facts of experience must actually be interpreted in terms of scripture if they are to be intelligible at all. When there is resistance to the evidences that we present in our presuppositional context, then we must push further and point out that there could be no understanding of anything in nature or history. There could be no science, no method that is epistemologically credible, apart from the Christian worldview that is taught in Scripture. And so Van Til, in short, contends, I am unable to follow Kuiper when from the fact of the mutually destructive character of the two principles, Kuiper means the regenerate and unregenerate presuppositions, from this he concludes to the uselessness of reasoning with the natural man. Christianity is objectively defensible, and the natural man has the ability to understand intellectually, though not spiritually, the challenge presented to him. And, contrary to Warfield, Manto says, no challenge is presented to him unless it has shown him that on his principle he would destroy all truth and meaning. Unless we are brought back in our evidential apologetic to the same underlying strategy which is used more generally for theistic proof. That's very interesting because you see one of the cardinal points of the old Princeton approach to apologetics, the traditional approach to apologetics, is the separation of a general defense of theism from a more specific defense of Christian theism. A separation of a philosophical defense of God's existence, natural um, theology, the theistic proofs, what have you. That's step one, and then step two being a scientific historical approach to the evidences to show that the Bible is the Word of God and Jesus is the Son of God. In Van Til's apologetic, these find their proper underlying unity in the presuppositional and transcendental strategy of arguing from the impossibility of the contrary, arguing by means of an internal critique of the unbeliever's worldview, and then presenting the only positive alternative, the Christian worldview, if the intelligibility of experience or any rational knowledge is not to be lost. So that the defense of God's existence 
Ultimately, it's the same as the defense of the truth of Scripture, the evidences for Christ's resurrection, and so forth. But the two parts of the Princeton approach are really one in Van Til. Van Til puts it this way. The true method for any Protestant with respect to the Scripture and with respect to the existence of God, that is to say, with respect to Christianity in detail and theism in general, the true method for any Protestant with respect to the Scripture and with respect to the existence of God must be the indirect method of reasoning by presupposition. In fact, it then appears that the argument for the Scripture as the infallible revelation of God is to all intents and purposes the same as the argument for the existence of God. In short, having and arguing for the right presuppositions is therefore the fundamental requirement in defending the faith, whether one takes as the, at the outset the existence of God or the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the subject for discussion. Thank you.